Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Scott Bissell. I'm with the Center for Faculty Excellence. And um, this is one of the breakout sessions that we offered at the recent faculty meeting. And we wanted to bring it to you in another format for those of you who were not able to attend the session when we offered it in Orlando. Uh, also with us today will, is our presenter, who is Dr. Ann Hacker. She is a contributing faculty member in the School of Public Policy and Administration. So I'm going to turn things over to her in just a moment. And we also have uh, Deepa Sharam, who is a contributing faculty member in the College of Undergraduate Studies. Um, and she's here with us as well. So uh, before I turn things over to Ann, I want to do a quick overview of how to use the GoToWebinar platform to make sure that you're able to fully use all the features and participate in the webinar. So if you look on the screen, uh, you'll see the control panel that I'm showing on the left side. You should see that on the right side of your screen, and it should look similar to what I'm showing on the PowerPoint slide. If for some reason, if your control panel is looking more like this in collapsed view, and you want to get the features back to be able to ask questions and use some of the other features in the control panel, all you have to do is just click the arrow button um, at the top of your minimized control panel, and then the full control panel will return back to you. There may be times when you want to toggle back and forth between this view and the minimized view we were looking at a moment ago. All you have to do is just click that arrow button, and that will allow you to do so. You might want to do that when there's text that might be showing on the right side of the screen that the control panel is blocking. So if you click that button, that will allow it to move off to the side, and uh, you'll be able to see everything on the slide that's being shared. Um, if you've not already done so already, you may want to just click the audio setup link. This will allow you to test both your microphone and your computer speakers to make sure everything's working with GoToWebinar. When you're doing the system test, don't worry about your voice being heard in the classroom. Um, it's just running through the test system, so it will not be broadcast. Only the system will hear your, your test. Um, we have put everyone's microphone on the mute setting just to cut down on any background noise. Uh, so that way you can hear our presenter clearly. So um, if you do have a question, we'll unmute you one at a time. So if you want to ask questions and share uh, your ideas, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can do that via text through the questions box. Just put your questions um, in the box here, click the send button, and then we'll receive it and we will address your question at the next available time. Um, if we respond back to you, like if you have a technical support question or something like that, you'll see it appear in the top part of the questions box here. The other way you can participate is by clicking the raise hand button. This will let us know you want to ask a question or share a thought. Um, and when we call on you, we'll unmute your microphone uh, so that you can share. A couple of other housekeeping items. Um, if you are having technical support, you can use the technical support phone number you see on the screen or just send the questions in the questions box and we can help you that way as well. You should also be seeing a link in the questions box for um, the closed captioning. If you wish to participate that way, uh, just look in the top part of the box, you should see a link and you'll be able to follow along with our closed captioning that's being provided by Mary Lee today. So with that, um, those are the kind of the highlights of how to use the um, GoToWebinar software. Um, Anne is going to be mentioning a Word um, document uh, that you might be want to take a look at while we're in the webinar. That link to that will be over in the questions area in just a moment. Um, so um, Anne will direct you. Uh, we'll mention that um, at the right time during the session. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Anne. And Anne, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and share your screen. So Dr. Ann Hacker, everyone. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, let me get this set up. There. Um, I'm, I hope that everyone can hear me. And um, the title of my presentation is Demystifying Coding in Qualitative Research. <clears throat> One of the, the reasons that I thought that this was a, an interesting topic to approach for a faculty meeting, and I was really pleased that uh, the Center for Faculty Excellence offered to um, to allow us to do these webinars is that um, I became really frustrated as a, as a dissertation mentor, as a committee member, and as a URR when students would say, I don't need a coding framework because I'm doing open coding. Or, um, and I would ask, well, can you explain what open coding is? And they couldn't. 
or I'm doing grounded theory research, so I don't need any theory, and therefore I don't need to code for anything. Um, again, a little bit of frustration. Or my very favorite was, and Vivo will do the coding for me, and I was grumbling to myself at that point, well, maybe we should give NVivo the PhD. Um, all of these reasons led me to um, come up with this presentation. And it's a very basic presentation. At the end of the presentation, there's some uh, resources if you want to really dig into more information on some of the more intricate uh, aspects of coding qualitative data. But the objectives of this presentation are to provide you as faculty with a foundation to guide students as they begin to use coding in their qualitative research, to understand different uses of coding, and design a simple code book for research proposals. Um, and I should add in here that we will also have a little discussion about um, some of the software that's available. So, what is coding? In a nutshell, coding simply allows for the transition between the data collection and the data analysis in qualitative research. <laughs> it helps steer the car. Now, none of us would get into a car and try to drive it without a steering wheel. Coding allows you to steer the um, the research so that it aligns with the research question, provides a framework uh, for um, so that we can start to see that the data is allowing for emerging themes uh, as the data is analyzed. <clears throat> there are examples of coding all around us in our everyday life. Libraries, financial management reports, and um, even the literature review that, that we do for research. Um, first example is the library. We've all been to the old-fashioned library with walls and books and shelves, and they tend to organize the books according to the Dewey Decimal System, where there are different codes. The 0 to 99 are general references. Uh, 100 to 199 is the philosophy books. So in essence, and I, I don't know if they can see my cursor, but the, the number is the code for the category or theme that um, it represents. Financial managers. Anyone who has uh, worked with budgets knows about cost centers and accounting codes. This is another way to organize the data so that it, it can be easily manipulated and um, um, analyzed, uh, whether it's through a statement of activity related to expenses, as in this example, where each accounting code has a further description and subcodes for um, under insurance, for example. Um, there are different subcodes. This is yet another example of codes that are used in our everyday life. And finally, the literature review. And I, I talked to a student at a residency who's starting to use NVivo, which is a qualitative data analysis software. She's using NVivo to take notes on the literature that she's reading. And so she's coding that literature um, for purposes of the literature review. So when she goes to write it, all she has to do is pull up all of the documents that she has read related to whatever theme she's writing. So this is just an example of a simple research question, what role does moral development, social construction play in policy decision making? And as we know, we ask the students to um, write, as they take notes, write across, pay attention to the methodology, the different themes that, that you're reading about, and of course you can add additional columns um, as you make new discoveries. And then as you write, you write your proposal or your literature review, you write down the column. So that's yet another way that we can look at coding from our everyday world. <laughs> Excuse me. 
In quali qualitative research, we know that data comes from many sources. It can come from artifacts, journals, field notes, um, videos or photographs, other types of media, or of course interview transcripts. Um, the challenge lies in providing a scaffolding to analyze the data that is collected. That's where coding comes into play. One of my favorite texts is Johnny Saldana's uh, coding, coding manual for qualitative researchers, and that uh, reference is given at the end of this presentation. But he describes that the code is simply a word or short phrase that symbolizes an attribute for a portion of language-based or visual data. So it allows you to stay focused. It allows you to stay uh, close to your data and focus so that you can know that you've answered your research question and so that others can have a, a little road map, so to speak, how you got there. <coughs> Creating a code book, I think for, for many students that I've worked with, um, it either is intuitive or it just seems such a terribly difficult process. So again, part of the purpose of this presentation is to help um, provide just a simple, simple way to look at how to create that code book that is required in the checklist, a coding framework. Um, first, we start with a research question. In this case, and I'm using the research question from my own dissertation or a version of it, um, what role does moral development and social construction play in policy decision making? You begin by using the theories and operational definitions that you've used from, brought in from the literature to create that first level of coding. In this case, the um, words in red letters are the first level of coding. <coughs> so you're already starting to align your research question with your theoretical framework. <clears throat> and this is done before data is even collected. And it, in one, another way to look at creating a code book is there, it's like a tree where the um, roots of the tree present as the ideas or observations that bring us into research. The research questions, the theoretical or conceptual framework are the trunk of the tree. And then the, the different theories or themes pro provide the branches or the parent codes and on into uh, child codes or secondary codes. And this is sometimes some students like to see pictures, so you know, I, I figure whatever works to help get in folks' head that there is a process, there's a flow to this coding business, that it's um, not just the Dr. Hacker's making up this extra piece of work for me to do. <coughs> so we take it into, again, the research question. In this case, the methodology was a content analysis and some elite interviews. The first stage of coding involves those three uh, theories, Kohlberg's moral development theory, Snyder and Ingram's work on social construction of um, interest groups, and Dunn and Peter's work on decision making. What I encourage students to do is to create a mind map or a concept map. Um, and in this case, again, you have the research question. The next level to the right of that research question involves the first level of coding. The pri you call it the primary codes. You can call it the parent codes. And then as the student is reading the literature and um, considering how am I going to um, conceptualize these theories, you start developing a secondary uh, tier or another branch. They can be called secondary codes, they can be called subcodes, they can be called child codes. But in terms of social construction, what um, in this particular uh, instance, I was looking at reality, knowledge, and groups. And then you can go on down. Um, what is important in this uh, 
diagram is the term groupthink because in this case groupthink could it definitely came out of social construction excuse me social construction of groups but it also connects to decision making theory and i think that that these overlaps are important to notice as you're developing your preliminary um, process and your preliminary data analysis but also um, as, and especially when you get into the actual data analysis. So after this coding tree or mind map is created, the next step is to put it into a coding framework that um, is easily translated into the proposal or um, that, that's kind of a quick reference for the student when they're doing the coding of the data. Um, <coughs> I was encouraged to keep that research question front and center, but um, then you just simply get into the uh, listing the theories or concepts, primary or parent codes. Um, in this instance, I put the authors. I, I think it's important that the research we do be based on previous research, that we're building on other research. Um, you could also expand this and add another column for the secondary codes. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, um, I also wanted to point out that after decision making there is a DM. In most of the qualitative data analysis software you can, you're going to need to code your data. And rather than typing in decision making, what I did was just put uh, an abbreviation DM. Bounded rationality became DMBR. Another way you can do that is by using a numerical code. Um, for example, social construction might be two. Interest groups, because it falls under social construction, might be 2.10, etc. So just different ways that that the student or the researcher can um, provide shorthand so that um, when they're coding the data they're not typing decision-making social construction. <clears throat> Are there any questions at this point? I wanted to take a few breaks to offer an opportunity for folks to ask questions if they needed to or wanted to. And remember, I think Scott uh, you can go ahead and click the raise hand button if you want to ask your question out loud, or if you type your questions into the questions box, we can address them there. So we'll give everyone just a couple seconds to see if there's anything you wanted to ask. If not, and uh, you can go ahead and move on, but I just want to see if anyone's yep. typing in. And it doesn't look like we have any hands. I don't see any hands, so... I think we're good to go if you want to keep going. Okie doke. We'll sally forth and tally ho. Okay, so... What I want to do is to give you an opportunity to practice coding um, <clears throat> because this really isn't, it's not rocket science. You can code just about anything. Um, in the handouts, in the worksheets that uh, Scott has, I see he's put the little link down there, you should have a restaurant menu, a grocery store map, and they look like this. This is the grocery store floor plan. And this is the restaurant menu. Now I don't know how to get backward. Um, there we go. And um, what I'd like to do is give you an opportunity to just spend maybe a minute or two thinking how would you set up a preliminary code book. Now um, when I did this at the faculty meeting someone said, well what's the research question? I think that you know you can come up with a research question based on your uh, particular field of interest. For example, if um, if you're in management, you might look at this grocery floor grocery store floor plan and wonder about um, traffic flow or you know is this an efficient setup. If you're in um, public health, you might excuse me, want to look at where the healthy choices for food are. Um, another thing, another way that you could code this information on this is to look at 
bakery, for example, bakery is down at the bottom left-hand corner, <clears throat> look at bakery as the parent code. What children or secondary codes might you find that would be part or a subset of bakery? Um, it could be pies, cake, cookies. And from there, you might look at um, each one of these sections and identify some children, child codes or secondary codes. And then your research question might be which uh, about healthy choices or green foods or um, foods that you would want your children to eat. <coughs> The restaurant menu, again, you could categorize it any way you wish, but um, I just wanted to give you two opportunities to look at um, just practice coding. The restaurant menu, you might want to you know, analyze or look at in terms of um, appetizers, main dishes, and then those are your parent codes, and then the uh, child codes would be whether it's meat, chick or beef, chicken, vegetables, vegetarian I, I, entrees, or something like that. And definitely, if you have questions, type them in or ask. This is this is a work in progress almost. Just give you a few, maybe a minute to look at these. I think in your worksheets you also received a sample um, coding framework to use. There we go. Ah, sorry. Does anyone have any um, ideas about setting up a preliminary code book that you would be willing to share? Um, so, Anne, we had someone who wrote in. Doran wrote ah. in um, and wanted to ask about an initial researcher bias. Okay. In, that's a pretty wide open question. <laughs> Initial researcher bias in terms of... Can you write in a little bit more, Doran, or if you want to click the raise hand button, we can unmute you. Um, yep, so we're going to open Doran's mic. Okay, go ahead, Doran. Great. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Um, I have a question uh, because um, most of the students will start asking me, um, where do you begin the coding? Mm -hmm. and, and one of the issues that I ask them is to start reading as many as articles as they can. And uh, they usually follow the gut feeling in terms of uh, what kind of uh, world they begin with. Uh -huh. uh, and, and one of the things I found out, that they, they have already a certain bias. For sure. example, if they're in business, they will use much more business theory, uh, business words and terminology versus the other. Uh, my suggestion to them was to keep a, a diary and to, to give the diary to somebody else and to see if they can see something else. Do, can you comment on the fact of how can they take away the bias in the beginning? Because uh, they already paved the way in a certain direction and they will look for articles with these keywords and obviously give them to a certain way. Sure, that I, I feel your pain or your angst. Um, what I've done in those, you know, when I um, have found students are kind of skewing in one direction, is I ask them to explore articles in a different field. So, um, for example, I'm in public policy and administration. Um, 
and I get a lot of people who want to work on child welfare issues. <coughs> and I tell them that, you know, the issue that brings us to research often is what forms the data that we're going to be analyzing. That the theories that we're looking at, um, for example, this dissertation that, my dissertation, the theories, social construction, decision making, and moral development, were um, what I used to examine a specific law uh, that was on the books related to child abandonment. Um, child abandonment was a real, it's a, a really, uh, it's one of those issues that hooks people. But that wasn't what the research was about. So um, what I suggest to students is look in anthropology or, you know, consider looking in um, some of the um, economics textbooks or an economics databases to see if there's been any work done on the theories that you see continually coming up. Um, and also, if, if I've sensed that they are starting to skew their literature review so that it, um, it, it feeds into their own biases, I will ask them to see if they can make a concerted effort to find articles that disagree with um, the consensus that they seem to be building and, and to code to look at the literature, um, if they're coding the literature in any way, um, to see if, try and look at not only the folks that agree, but also how, how do the other researchers disagree? Is anyone finding um, uh, data or results that don't agree with the consensus that they're trying to build? Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I can just tell you from my own experience, a uh, two short issue. One is that student, foreign students, mm -hmm. sometimes find it uh, challenging to challenge certain opinions. Sure, sure. When I ask them to challenge that thing. Second is that uh, I encourage my students to do search in different languages using uh, Google Translate. Uh-huh. And, uh, and it's very interesting what you can find out when you read how Japanese look at relationship, how Korean looking at uh, an attitude and so forth. That's my that, comment. That's a great suggestion. I'm going to use that. <laughs> that's really good. I like that. Thank you. That's Any so other we do questions have, or yeah. thoughts about coding? We have a couple that came in, and we have one more hand that's raised. So we'll go to the the ideas that were typed in first. Um, Anne wrote in um, maybe sharing grocery store coding for sustainability in local foods, um, coding each item as a carbon footprint, you know, packaging, shipping, uh, something cool. like that. That's a really um, that would be idea. really interesting. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. And then um, David has his hand raised. David, did you want to share? Okay. I don't know. I'm, are you hearing me? Okay. I'm. Yep. Okay, thanks. Uh, actually, you know, I, I did the same thing with the grocery store. I, I didn't do it on paper because I was multitasking, but I thought about the issue of buying local food and, and the, the whole sustainability idea uh, using that as my framework. So I was, I was on the same page as Anna. I was also thinking about the question that came in and, and this whole concept mapping idea. I use that a lot with my students when they're writing their literature review and I like them to do some of that when they're when they're building their uh, their codes and their uh -huh. schemes uh, and I think drawing things out visually like that uh, gives you a, a good sense of where your your where your data is taking you and where you might be taking the data and and then you can come in and say to yourself, I need to be true to my data. My data drives this research yes. analysis, not my bias. And that's where you can look at why you might be seeing the data in a different way because it, it puts it in, it's like looking in the mirror. So I thought I would share that. Thank you. You know, I, I, one of the things I like about the concept map is that it's so visual and if a student shares it with me, I can sit back and look at it and say, you know, 
One thing that seems missing from here is consideration of this other issue. Um, it's a lot easier for me to see the big picture when I see a map as opposed to charts and charts and charts. So um, from a mentoring standpoint, it's just a great tool. And there's lots of free programs out there to do mapping. <coughs> Is there any other, are there any other questions, Scott? Yes, one other thing that came in, um, <laughs> uh, Yvette uh, wrote in, uh, the SAGE Handbook on Research, um, it's available online, has a great article called uh, Data Lies and or When Data Lies, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope you wrote that down. <laughs> <laughs> when Data Lies. Sometimes it does. Well, let's move on then. Um, so the next step, how does data connect with that data analysis portion of the proposal? I, th I think it's fair to say that coding will provide um, some parameters for data analysis that are ba clearly based on the theories or concepts that are framing the research. Um, as a URR, um, one of the things I'm looking for is alignment throughout the proposal. Does the research question, the theories, the methodology, do they all align so that um, it appears feasible that this proposal is going to be able to answer the research question? <laughs> and so <clears throat> coding helps with that alignment issue. Um, the first stage coding will, will um, set the stage and um, it often happens before, um, before data is even collected in terms of establishing this code book. But <laughs> then the data has to be collected, whether it's interview data or archival material, documents, um, videos, media. The student is then going to have, or the researcher is then going to have to encode and decode the data and then interpret it. Um, the coding framework can be used, very useful when that happens because it provides parameters to keep from straying and also will help, help you recognize when a new theme starts to emerge. So we're talking about data encoding and decoding the data. Encoding data involves just assigning the appropriate codes to the data. Um, you go through, I, I know a number of students think they want to do qualitative uh, research because it's easier. Um, I don't know if research is ever easy, but um, there is a lot of detail that goes into it. And um, so that first stage you go through, uh, you start assigning appropriate codes to the data. It might be you're doing pen and, uh, pen and paper or color coding things. Um, this is more in line with open coding, where you're just looking at, here's my coding framework. How does this apply to this data? And then you go back and you decode the data, where you, you start looking deeper and seeing if there's um, any additional meaning related to that preliminary coding framework. Um, it's truly an iterative process, whether you use the old-fashioned pen and paper and color coding it yourself or you use qualitative data analysis software, there is, it's a multiple step process. Um, you start looking for patterns in the data. Um, Similarities are things that happen the same way from interview to interview or from document to document. Um, is there any, anything that's going on differently but it seems to be somewhat predictable? Uh, are things happening with a, with a, in any patterns or is there an order to the way things are happening or being described in the data? Um, <laughs> are, are things occurring as a result of a certain event or activity? When I 
Um, in my own research, I mentioned that I was uh, looking at a law that related to uh, Safe Delivery of Newborns Act, Abandoned Babies. And the law pre was precipitated as a result of children being left in car wash bays. Um, as a result of that, there was some emotional pieces that came in for um, legislators and high-level uh, bureaucrats. And <clears throat> the people I interviewed would, were very, very willing to share their, their anger that th those instances happened and how they came in into their uh, position of supporting this particular piece of legislation. <clears throat> So there was definitely a sequence, there was an order, um, and although thank, thankfully we don't have a lot of babies being abandoned, um, it was frequent enough to get people's attention. Um, but again, I was looking at moral development, decision-making behaviors, uh, was this policy made based on uh, what type of decision-making behavior. So I was coding I was definitely paying attention to the emotional aspects that went into it because, again, part of it was moral, moral decision making, but also coding for um, different aspects of rationality and how different um, uh, stakeholders were attributed different social construction levels. So, um, and uh, you also start noticing that there's overlap. As I mentioned before, some, some parts of different concepts may relate to two or three of your theoretical framework or your primary codes. So <clears throat> it's important that students not rush through this, that they take time, they look for these patterns, and that they code for the patterns. <clears throat> So there's an inductive process where you're projecting the framework onto the data and deductive where you're also allowing for additional codes to emerge. You might notice that if you have two codes that are continually, two or three codes that are continually repeating as a pattern, that might mean that there's an, a pattern that you didn't initially consider that is a new code that emerges. This is just an example of line-by-line -line coding where the chunk of data, Mrs. Jackson rises from her desk and announces blah, 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 and the researcher is coding, number one, lining up for lunch. She's announcing, let's get lined up for lunch. Um, the second code is managing behavior where she... Um, then she looks at them and says, no talking. Lining up for lunch again, row two, five children seated, ta, ta, ta. Um, so this is line by line coding. Um, there are, I th think most of the qualitative data analysis software definitely will do line by line coding. Um, some of them will only do line by line coding. Uh, Atlas TI is one of them. <coughs> Simultaneous coding allows for multiple codes to be embedded in a chunk of data. So it allows for deeper meaning, meaning to emerge. And this is where I think um, it's that second and third iteration of the coding that um, where this starts to become more evident. Uh, I suggest to students that when they do their initial coding for their data that they just go through very quickly and apply what the obvious codes are. Take a day off, take two days off, go back and code um, the, the second time through and then start looking for simultaneous codes. <clears throat> and also to pay attention for deeper meaning to emerge. Um, someone mentioned a journal uh, as you're doing the literature review. Uh, there's also great value in keeping a, a log book um, or a journal as you're doing any kind of research, but especially when you're coding, uh, to keep, a, keep notes. And some of the software will allow you to take notes 
so that as you're coding, if something pops into your head, the note is attached to that particular segment of data. And since qualitative data analysis software is very useful, um, I thought it would be worthwhile just talking a little bit about it. Um, Ethnograph is one that I'm very familiar with. Atlas TI um, is another one that's kind of uh, useful. Again, it, it, it only allows for line-by-line -line coding. And Vivo, many of our students are using. Hyper Research is a free version. It's a uh, free software, um, and it's very similar to NVivo. Um, Poly Analyst <coughs> is outrageously expensive, I think, but it also will do everything but your laundry. It is phenomenal uh, ca capacity for doing qualitative data analysis on um, documents. We, um, Max QDA is another one that uh, I know has been mentioned. I don't know, does, do folks online have any, any other qualitative data analysis software that they know of or could recommend? If you could just type that into the little section and uh, that would, into the um, question box, that might be helpful. Um, regardless, of what, what software you're going to use, you still need to tell the software what to code for. And this is where the coding tree, code book, coding framework, whatever you're going to call it, comes into play. Um, you have to start somewhere. A um, good example is I had a student who was um, working on veterans' disability benefits. And um, we're going to see a um, an example in a little bit, but she she decided just to see what this software would do. So she allowed the software to do the coding for her. Didn't put in any code words, just did a told the software to code for her. And what it did is that it did a frequency of which words were used most, factoring out you know words like the. And um, lo and behold the most frequently coded word in all of the documents was veteran. Well, she was working on veterans' disabilities. So <coughs> she says, well, that makes perfect sense. Now let's put in the codes. And when she put in her code, she coded the data and uh, did a run of, once she's coded it, um, she got completely different results. So it is important that you put your own codes in and, and you code your data yourself. So you, when you're using the software, you import the data. Most of the data is going to be digital. Um, you decode it by reading the text to decipher it. Um, you encode the data using your coding framework. And you keep doing that um, iterative process until the data start to talk, um, little voices, and allow new codes to emerge. And that's when I think when what we do, we know it's labor intensive, but it also can be really exciting to see the new information that starts um, coming out as a result of, of the work that we're doing. So <laughs> first stage coding is um, usually done open. You're encoding the data. You're determ it's, you set, establish that first coding cycle before data is collected based on your research question and your theories. And then the second stage where you're coding data, um, looking at different patterns, processes, similarities, differences, <clears throat> and that sort of thing. Let's see. <laughs> When interpreting data, um, it's important to pay attention to the high and low frequencies as well as the middle frequencies. Normally, the software will pre present a frequency table. So you'll know which coded segments of data popped up most frequently. In the old days, we would color code and then count the colors. Um, <coughs> That was very labor-intensive. Um, 
now we can let the software do it, then describe each one of those high, low, and middle frequencies in relation to the research question, and look at where there might be overlap that demonstrates that your coded terms and frequencies um, are either allowing new information to emerge or demonstrating a consolidation, as it is, was the case with the, the group think uh, child code. <clears throat> this is an example of a frequency table. Um, it, you could order it according to the theories or concepts or according to frequencies. In this case, um, and remember that the, the question was, what role do these things play in policy decision making? Um, moral development, and this actually was the actual results from uh, the research, was that um, policy decision makers tended to make decisions based on a fairly low level of moral development. We would like to hope that they're thinking of the greater good, but um, in this case it was very clear that the group that, we, that was interviewed and that was studied were trying to get reelected. Um, and it was a good, good policy to, to, you know, get a lot of mileage out of. <coughs> anyway, so the the frequencies are presented and the discussion would be based on the frequencies, the high, the low, and I like students to look at the middle. Um, another way that this, these frequency tables can be presented is in terms of, of graphic representation. Now this is the student who did um, her dissertation on the Veterans Disability Compensation System. And as I mentioned, when she first just let the software do her coding for her, it popped up with veteran was the most important word in the whole thing. When she coded, um, coded the data and went back through a couple iterations and then wanted to look at how, does, how do the formulators and implementers of this policy um, consider various aspects um, this was one of 40 diagrams that pop that she um, presented, and this was related to um, how the formulators and implementers of this policy did they consider <clears throat> uh, transition and trans transition issues of veterans who were processing from active duty to being a disabled veteran status. So they were making a status change. And what really popped out as a result of this diagram that didn't show quite as cleanly on her frequency tables was that all of the networking and the discussions about veterans disability compensation system and um, in the 40,000 pages of documents that she looked at from formulators and implementers of that policy, nobody talked about transfer or transition of those veterans from active duty to um, um, non-active duty status. And that just really, that spoke volumes. So, and this is from the polyanalyst software. Um, it does some pretty other phenomenal things, but uh, I think you can also develop some of these really neat diagrams using the other software as well. I just wanted to show this because of the, the outliers are important to discuss as well, or what we would call outliers in uh, quantitative research. <clears throat> so to summarize the steps in qualitative data analysis, first you define those preliminary codes. Um, you develop your preliminary coding framework using the, uh, the theories that relate directly to the research question. You collect your data, you encode it, you continue to do that, reducing it to cancel any identical statements. Um, it is an inductive and deductive process. There is that iteration that goes back, back and forth. Um, you keep doing that until you have your 
um, your themes start to emerge and you have a clear picture that will answer your research question. And um, sometimes it's not a very clean and straightforward process, but more often than not, I think if, if the student goes into it with a clear idea of the parameters and the structure that they are going to be looking at as they analyze their data, they can come out on the other end with um, a, a good analysis of the data and the findings and a really nice discussion. So with that, any more questions? Or are there any questions? Yes, we actually have a few questions that have come in, and so let me start and tackle those. All right. Um, someone wrote in that when they sent in um, the abstract uh, with the CEO, that the, the question came back about what was used for coding. So uh, can you elaborate on the types of coding? What might it be a best practice for a doctoral level study? And if this is used in conjunction with a quantitative, qualitative, or even mixed methods study? Were they, were they asking what type of coding, as in open coding or axial coding, or were they looking at what software was used for coding? Or, it, you know, did the student do uh, manual coding, or did they use qualitative data analysis software? Um, I've never had that question come back, and I'm trying to think most of my students will note, because I do primarily qualitative um, work, uh, most of them will mention that they use qualitative data analysis software. They don't mention the specific brand. Um, okay. And actually, unfortunately, I, I can't clarify because the person's left the, yeah. had to leave the, the meeting, so I oh, get that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, a couple other questions that have come in. Um, are there books or articles or other resources that you would recommend as resources that students should have in their library? Yes, and two of them are at the end. One is, one is Saldana's um, The Coding Manual for Qualitative Researchers. The other is Miles and Huberman, and they added Saldana. Uh, Miles Huberman and Saldana's <clears throat> Qualitative Data Analysis. I think the coding manual is probably, it came out kind of before Miles and Huberman did their new edition, and evidently it was so impressive that they added Saldana as an author for the latest edition of their textbook. So um, I've just, I found Saldana's book to be a gold mine, and I, I recommend it to all of my students, and they get it, and they Wow, this is just amazing. <laughs> All right, so a couple other questions have come in. Um, mm -hmm. we had two people, um, Anne and uh, Georgiana, actually asked the same question. So you know, the university provides SPSS for free um, <laughs> to students. Is there any kind of similar arrangement for a qualitative um, software that the university provides in the charts? I do not think so. I, I think I... I at one time, they were really encouraging in vivo. Um, the students, as I understand, have, can buy a limited license for in vivo. Um, I don't know why they do SPSS, but they won't do some qualitative software. But um, hyper research, <coughs> excuse me, it, I've had a couple students use hyper research, which is free. And they have found that it has worked just fine. Now, you know, they weren't analyzing 40,000 pages of documents, but if you're interviewing 10 to 15 participants, and um, I think hyper-research will allow for 100 data sources. So, you know, you have 10 long transcripts. Hyper-research will do just fine. Um, most students will, you know, look at the different software that's out there and uh, make a decision whether this is going to be good for them or not. I just hate to see people spending so much money and, you know, are they going to use it again? It would be nice if Walden would make some arrangements, but oh well. 
<laughs> okay. That's you. outside of my uh, job description. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, Anne. Uh, we did have one person ask if the if copies of the slides would be sent after. Yes, we absolutely would. Um, and someone did bring that Atlas T um, also offers a student package as well. Yes. So that might be another reference. Um, Doron asks, uh, would you suggest that we encourage students to go through a peer review process to iron out bias and or improve coding? Um, sure, why not? I mean, I, well, I have my um, students in my 9000 shell give presentations to each other before they, um, oops, sorry, before they um, send or schedule their dissertation presentation. Um, I think if they, if there's enough that they, if there's enough in the 9000 shell or even if they've networked with some people at residencies, um, that would be a great way to get feedback. Um, you know, the residencies we do offer them an opportunity to give presentations and get that peer feedback, but you can only do so many there. So I think that's a great idea. All right, and it looks like we're all caught up on questions. Okay, well, I would like to thank the students from my 9,000 dissertation class who have put up with me rambling on about this for about a year and a half. They have been my peer reviewers. And, you know, when given an opportunity to get back at me, they were really, really critical. Very good, very supportive, but um, really asked hard questions. Also, colleagues at Walden who are too many to mention um, for their input. Um, I really would like to continue developing this, so a um, little out of order, but these are just a few of the resources, and if um, there's Miles and Huberman and Saldana's book, books. Um, if you have any comments, inputs, or want to collaborate on developing this more, please feel free to contact me. Um, I think that, again, as students start to see that this is not that difficult and it does have purpose, um, the dissertations, the, the proposals um, become a lot better aligned and the dissertation can become um, the detail that needs to go into the data analysis becomes is facilitated by a really good coding framework. So um, thank you for your time and your questions. And thank this you, evening. yep, thank you, Dr. Ann Hacker, for all these uh, great tips you shared and our attendees for the ideas and questions today. Mm -hmm. uh, one last housekeeping item: I have put the feedback survey link in the questions area. If you want to give us feedback out there, um, as follow up, as I mentioned, we will send you a follow up email with the recording link and a link to the PowerPoint. So, looks like we are all caught up on questions, and uh, you have some kudos from your some of your colleagues and who are attending. Who thank you. For great presentation. Thank um, so, you. Yeah, thank you everyone and have a good rest of the evening. Goodbye for now everyone. This ends our webinar. Good night. <laughs>